Wow. Ah, oh, this is a really cool stage. It's awesome to have you, Mark, over here. Like, uh, I know that you got a fever last <laughs> night, so thank you for, for making it to the stage in, in any case. How are you feeling? I will say that at about 3 or 4 a.m., I thought there's no way I'm going to be speaking at Slush today. So I'm just happy to uh, be here. And it's a real honor to, to get to uh, participate in this. And it is amazing that there's a conference of 20,000 people uh, <clears throat> in Northern Europe at maybe the worst time of year. I guess you're proud of that. Uh, <laughs> and that you all, we all share this passion together for entrepreneurship. And I think you should all give yourself a round of applause for being here today. No, thank you for coming to Helsinki. And it's your first time in Helsinki, right? Yes. Excellent. Welcome. Maybe next time I'll visit in summer. <laughs> But uh, it's an awesome honor to have you here because uh, Finland, where we are currently, is known for its mobile games. And you guys with Zynga were the ones that started kind of the social gaming revolution on Facebook, uh, where we see hundreds of companies across the Nordics working on like different platforms from Facebook to mobile. Uh, but let's start with actually that. So you guys started Zynga in 2007. So like, how did it get started? What led to the founding of Zynga? What was kind of the thought in your head that led to you guys actually starting working on the company? Um, well, it, it may be hard for us all to remember today that in 2007, gaming was, the games industry was mature and declining. The web game industry uh, was really pretty terrible. I mean, it was, it was not considered a good business. Um, and as an entrepreneur, I think for so many of us, it's great to uh, pursue an industry that is mature uh, with the insight that maybe this industry hasn't even started its real growth phase yet. And you think about Google was like the 56th search engine. Um, and similarly, you know, there was no, it, the gaming industry was uh, <clears throat> really focused on serving a much more hardcore market. And, and the opportunity that we saw was to bring games to a mass market so of like busy adults. So everyone can play games, in yeah. a way. And, and the, the idea, that the kernel of the vision for us and for social gaming was to say, what if gaming could be part of this cocktail party? And what if gaming, what if social gaming could be its own social medium for people? And even if they weren't hardcore gamers, they could actually uh, use games as a way to connect with, with people in their lives. Yeah, so in a way, like, people were already on Facebook, but they, they were not doing things like games together. So your first game with Zynga was actually a poker game. So um, like, uh, your background, you've done like, a, a, a different startups in the past. You're a serial entrepreneur. You did a social network before that. So how did you got, like, you were one of the first people to actually start working on Facebook games. So what happened? Well, first of all, uh, it's kind of funny that I started one of the first social networks that I'm pretty sure nobody here has ever heard of called Tribe.net. Um, and it was pretty amazing to manage to fail as a social network when uh, <clears throat> it, that, it was just a new concept uh, and people would get an email saying you have a friend request or whatever and they'd actually open the email and do it. And I still managed to fail with Tribe and the big insight that I got that I brought to what I did with Zynga was that as entrepreneurs, we are on this journey to try to isolate our winning instincts from our losing ideas. And with Tribe, I stubbornly stuck to one instinct and one idea um, and never tried anything new. And I was determined with Zynga to really not be attached to any one idea, but to say, how do I uh, get a lot of shots on goal and, and pursue a lot of different angles against this social gaming. And, and the first was poker, and luckily uh, it worked. It, it was the only innovation was this, we had this realization that people were hanging out on Facebook, and I realized from Tribe that people just wanted to hang out there. Um, they wanted to connect, and there wasn't an easy way to connect. But by giving them a poker game, it was like an always-on bar. Um, and, and so people really responded to that. 
uh, and it resonated. Um, and then we started to try a lot more games. And, and the irony is most of those games failed. And they, we hit a point where we, hit, we were supporting like 10 games, uh, and poker was just one of them. And we, we had to kind of retrench and say, wait, let's make this one game much better at the expense of the rest. And we actually killed most of the other games. And we really focused in on how do we go vertically deep, and how do we make this into more of a franchise and a forever service. And, and that poker game is still one of the top games you know, 10 or 11 years later. And it's just a reminder that consumers want us, they don't want to try lots of new things. They don't want to move from app to app. They want the one thing they're in to get better and better. Yeah. And like when Facebook opened its, uh, opened its API, you were just one of many developers that are kind of thinking about doing games on Facebook. And yet, like Zynga today is worth over three billion, and it's a publicly listed company. And most of the other players were not able to grow such a big company or ultimately fail. Like, what was it about you guys from the start that allowed you to actually build one of the winning companies? Um, I've thought about that. I think that the prevailing wisdom in uh, startups and, and product making by 2007 in the Valley and probably everywhere else was this idea of fail fast. And I think John Doerr was famous for saying it. Um, and the problem with building this MVP, minimum viable product, and then trying to fail or succeed in a binary way was that you were building products in a vacuum. And the, the idea that we got to very early on with Zynga was instead of focusing on this fail state, we needed to be in a learn state. And we needed to quickly have a game out with a live audience and then iterate. And, and we had such an advantage versus the game industry because at that time, and it's a little bit like that again today, the game industry might spend two years making a game before they brought it to an audience. We might spend four to six weeks and so the number of engineering days that you've wasted um, is much less. So, so at the end of the day, you're thinking, how do I maximize the amount of engineering days I'm spending on things that my customers really want? And, and, we, and, and, and we were probably testing 100 different ideas a week. And the game industry was probably testing for a year. Yeah. And that takes us to an interesting topic. Like, you've been characterized as a product maker. Uh, as an entrepreneur. That's kind of what kind of an entrepreneur you want to be. Uh, so when you're building a company, like it starts very much without data, with creativity and ideas. Uh, and then it leads to actually getting data and improving, improving the things that you're building based on that. So how do you actually balance between this creativity and you know, uh, getting to scale and you know, building this big company where you can't be as attached to all the things anymore? Well, there's a lot of answers to that. Um, it's a tension that we all face. We, hopefully, we all face it as our companies uh, do really well. And there's this question of, should I, as a CEO, if we got here because I had some good instincts and abilities around making products that people like, now all of a sudden, as you're scaling, we're spending our time on things that we're not necessarily great at, and, and we're not making our products better, but we're spending time on scale. And, and I hit a point where I had been spending all this time on scaling and not on products, and I just said, fuck scale. And I said, what I want to do is make sure all that matters, the, and people say that micromanagement is this terrible thing. I think micromanagement is a beautiful thing in the eyes of our customers. So if, if we're at uh, McDonald's or a single restaurant, we want to have a perfect experience every time, and we don't care how many people they're serving today. We just care that our experience is great. And similarly, when we're making products, we've got to care at the pixel level. We've got to really care about quality, um, and, and it's very hard to do that when we're spending our time in management meetings and you know, not product meetings. So in a way, even though you, know, you were scaling as a company, you tried to stay very close to the products and very close to the customers, not kind of getting carried away and live this kind of business world and, and fundraising and all these things. So stay very true to the customer. Yeah, and, and I, think, I think that the best consumer product CEOs uh, have their hands deeply in the details. And, and 
the current CEO of Zynga, who's awesome, happy to say, uh, he's deep in the details, and, and that makes me feel a lot better. So let's talk about games. So, uh, w like, one thing that's very harsh about the gaming industry is that it's a very creative industry. Like, if you're not creating new things and going forward, at some point you will run out of, like, uh, people playing your games. So you constantly have to recreate yourself. So how do you actually think about, like, new gaming concepts and you're trying to evaluate a new product idea that whether this is going to be something successful or not? Do you have any methodology or philosophy how you think about this? Well. <clears throat> I, there's a lot of answers to that again. So, so the first answer is we came upon this idea that we wanted to run a game as a live service. and We wanted to treat it as a franchise. And we wanted to grow our audience and our business by growing these franchises, not by going horizontal and creating more games and features, but vertical. Um, and, and a mantra inside our company was this idea of bold beats. And a bold beat is a positive disruption in the consumer experience. It's some it, it, it can be dumb. In Farmville, um, an engineer spent a half a day making the animals move. And all of a sudden, the players started to imagine these new dimensions of gameplay. Um, and my friend Bing said, you know, it's, it's an idea that, that might make people want to play for three more months. Um, so I think that um, it's really important that we focus on you know, what, what the consumer wants and not try to force them to, to go And I guess this more. is one, one like, um, a trap for, for most product people, that you want to make everything better and you want to create something new for the world. But I guess, like, people mostly, they don't want everything better and everything new. So how, do you have some sort of a way that you actually think about this when you were making games with Zynga? Yes, thank you for reminding me of that, Mickey. Uh, so I, I taught this class on product making at Stanford Business School, and the core concept that, that we really use the framework at Zynga. Um, and, and I think you can use this concept not just in thinking about game making, and I know that we're kind of in the capital of game making in the world, in Helsinki, and I'm happy to say Zynga has a studio here now. Um, but it's this idea of proven better new. And when Steve Jobs came back to Apple, he said the problem with the company was that they were trying to make every feature 10% better, and the whole product was getting 50% worse. And we have to put our egos aside as product makers and realize it's so hard to make a product or a feature better. And it takes so much polish. Um, the way we can de-risk our new company, our new product, is by saying, how do we isolate the new idea, the, the innovation you want to test, from the ideas that you're not testing? And, and to take, those are proven and, um, Mickey was at Supercell. I, I was so impressed when I saw Heyday. I thought they did such an amazing job of taking the innovations that we had built at Farmville 2 and on the web and taking that to mobile. And, and you said you know, backstage that they had this one idea of, hey, what if on an iPad the main gameplay is a swipe? Yeah, so instead they, of looking like this when people play, it would look like this. So tap, tap to swipe. It sounds like a small idea. But it turned out to be a huge idea um, that was the germ, the seed of an entire company. So in a way, like having something new, making something significantly better, but that should be like only some, a couple of things, maybe 20% of the thing, and then having 70 80% more of a like proven concept in yeah, a way. And the irony of this that we kind of sometimes forget is if you can make a new product that has no new idea in it, uh, but the only thing that's new is, hey, there's never been a farming game that's easy to use on mobile, and we're going to have no new ideas other than that. That's awesome, because we already know people like farm games. Um, let's not try to barrage them with a whole bunch of other new ideas at the same time, because people don't love new ideas. And talking about ideas, like looking at Zynga, you have an like, amazing portfolio of games that you know, over a billion people have played globally, like coming from Farmville and Mafia Wars to draw something, words with friends, so forth. So where do you actually get ideas, like both as an individual and as a company? Because you constantly have to be creating new concepts and creating new creative, creative ideas. Well, I, I kind of have two answers to that. The first is I love to see mashups. I love to see, I used to call it Frankensteining the game and saying, what would happen if we had location check-in and dating and farming? Like, let's throw those all together and see if that's cool or bad. And, and so I think 
constantly trying to mash up a lot of things that you're seeing, like, oh, Pokemon Go, that's, that's cool, but what would it be like if Pokemon Go met, you know, married Farmville or Words of Friends? Um, so so the, the first point is, is that we want to uh, try these mashups. But the second point that I don't know about you guys, but it's on my mind a lot today is we need an environment that makes it really easy to take our ideas and quickly test them. And, and it feels like it's getting hard on mobile. It feels much harder than we had on Facebook web. And I'm wondering what's next and how are we going to get to this open environment on mobile that, that lets us iterate on our ideas with live audiences again very quickly. You see, like, when you started Zynga, that cocktail party was Facebook. Like, what are the cocktail parties you're looking at today that you think might be kind of the next big platforms where games will thrive? Um, yeah, so, so Facebook served as this amazing cocktail party, and it, it allowed us to, to drop games and apps in in a way that enhanced that experience instead of needing people to come to that. Um, on mobile today, we're excited about, I'm excited about uh, Facebook Messenger opening up um, and allowing uh, HTML-based games, and we're doing a lot there, and we can move quickly. We're wondering if Snapchat's going to open up. But I feel like, as developers, we shouldn't just wait for these platforms to open up. And I'm curious, I'm inspired by what we're seeing in crypto technologies and the public blockchain, and the way that there's a whole ecosystem that is now working together that feels very open, the way the internet felt open in 1994. Um, and I'm wondering if there's a metaphor that we can take to mobile, um, that, that we can stop all working on our own and start being interconnected. So more, more like a community of companies learning from each other and building games, and having a gamer community instead of everyone building their own thing on, on the App Store. Yeah. Something like that. Um, talking about inspiration, so uh, we were talking backstage about your favorite book. So could you actually tell a bit more about that? Because I think that's a very interesting topic. Well, at, at, at this point, I think uh, it's nothing new. But I've been, I've been inspired uh, for years now by Ready Player One. Has everyone here read that book? Has anyone heard about Ready Player One? Less than I thought. <laughs> It's going to be an amazing it's a great movie, book. I think. Read it. Steven Spielberg's making. It'll probably do really well. I tried to buy the movie rights. <laughs> um, that didn't work. Um, but Ready Player One, I think, did a better job of pointing to this near future and, and what these virtual world experiences might be like. Um, and, and I've had an idea that I'll throw out to all of you, and maybe you'll do something with it. I have an idea that I blogged about 12 or 15 years ago called Dot Earth. And I thought, what if there was something that was like Minecraft meets Second Life, um, but it was, it was an open platform where there was software that anyone can go use. Any entrepreneur or developer could add a server to Dot .earth. You could add a whole virtual world. It could be Dot .space. Um, there might be a, a, a common data transfer protocol so that the, the consumers could bring their avatars and virtual goods and currencies um, from game to game and, and all be interconnected. Um, so that was completely inspired. I, I blogged about before there was Ready Player One, and then Ready Player One kind of put even more uh, focus on it. So in a way, like having a game where you're playing as an avatar with other people, but you can be playing World of Warcraft or something completely different inside the same world. And that's something that, uh, like, are you want, do you want to be a part of building that? Are you seeing someone building that right now today? Or are you still <clears throat> waiting for that to happen? You know, th there's another related idea that, that I'll throw out to all of you that, that I'm wondering about a lot. I feel like our experience on this phone, and I wanted to get a picture of all of you, but I don't know if this will really work. <laughs> I'm going to do it while I talk. Yeah, it kind of works. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, the experience on the phone. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm losing it. Um, I, I'm wondering if we are on the, the verge of a new metaphor for how, how do we browse our mobile experience? Because 
This feels like Windows 95, and it feels, it used to be packaged software, now there's an app store, which is awesome. But there is no metaphor for us as consumers. We open this and we have to stare at it and say, which app will I use? And the browser is just one area. What if Google Maps became a new browsable surface and Canvas page and ecosystem? What if we as developers could offer apps that our users could instantiate um, on Google Map? What if uh, you might find words with friends? You might navigate your Google Map by social. You might be interested in where are friends or interesting people around here and what are they doing? Oh, I want to connect with them around a game that they're playing, um, or Pokemon Go, AR. I, I, think I'm, I think we need that as consumers, and we definitely need it as app developers. We need this new metaphor. So in a way, we're using Alta Vista when Google is still to come, but we think that there's not going to be anything like after this. Yeah, and, and I'll say my, what makes me so optimistic is at every one of these moments, and I'm dating myself, but going back since, since the beginning of the internet, whether it was AOL or Yahoo, we think it's over, we think it's all been played out, and we wish we had had the idea for Facebook or whatever. I did, I failed. Um, and, and then you have this realization with history that the growth hasn't even started yet. And so we have, I, I think you can have this instinct to know that there's so much more ahead of us, um, and there's so much more that this experience could really deliver, and we're really waiting for the next platform to open that up. But I'm hopeful that maybe it's not housed in a single company, and, and where I'm inspired by, again, by what I'm seeing with cryptocurrencies is I'm curious whether there's a new model that might get to uh, this kind of post-capitalism, post-investor moment where um, there could be a much more pure alignment between the, us as makers and our users um, where we're just trying to create more happy super fans and we're not necessarily trying to siphon off energy and profits to, to send back to an so investor. So the users and the consumers would own the companies instead of like someone owning the company, the company making users for products, and at the same time trying to make profit. So a direct ownership of a company. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, people here know Blue Bottle Coffee. They were just acquired by Nestle, which is an amazing outcome for them and their investors. But it's not obvious why Blue Bottle's product is going to be better now that they're owned by Nestle. Um, I'm curious if it was a couple of years from now, could they have floated a blue bottle coin where all they had to do is try to make more happy super fans of blue bottle um, and that was all that they were focused on and accountable for. So no more exits to investors, exits to, or not exits, but continuing the story with users. I, our customers uh, aren't really looking for an exit. You know, if you love a product, you hope it's there forever. Yeah, and we'll continue on those topic in, in the founder studio. So thank you very much, Mark, for being here in Helsinki, being on stage, even though you're sick. Uh, and we'll continue in the founder yeah. studio. Thanks, Mickey.